Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, for us to have the final, final presentation, the final talk here in the conference. I just wanted to inform those who might not have heard through the grapevine, but Nick Stern was unable to get through from Mexico to Brazil, so we are going to uh, not have a two-person final panel here. Uh, the panel is going to be uh, chaired here by Bob Costanza uh, with a talk by Prime Minister Jimmy Thimley and then commentary by Josh Farley and that will be nearly the end and then B Bina and I and Paolo will have the last word thanking you all. Bye bye. Can you hear me? There we go. <laughs> Welcome everyone to this final session. with his Honorable Prime Minister of Bhutan. Before we get started, let me just maybe pick up a little bit on um, the previous two talks, which I think have really laid out uh, in some detail uh, the significant problems that we face as a society. Um, I think <coughs> Bill and Matthias left us maybe with a, kind of a pe pessimistic conclusion you know, how will we ever solve these problems given the nature of, uh, of humans? I believe that there are solutions and I think we need to think very deeply about what those solutions are and how we might, how we might achieve them. I think part of the problem, Bill asked the, the, uh, the question, <clears throat> um, you know, what, why if we have all of this intelligence uh, are we still headed in such a, a bad direction? Uh, towards the edge of a cliff. I think one answer is that we are addicted to the current situation as a society. We've, we've been in this, this, uh, this nice situation for a little too long. And I think we could learn a lot from um, the psychology of individual addictions and how people can uh, overcome those addictions. And one of the lessons I think from that that study is that probably the worst thing you can say to an addict if you're trying to get them to overcome an addiction is is to just tell them all the bad things that they're doing all the things that will go wrong etc that leads immediately to denial <clears throat> and, and uh, 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 sort of stepping back and I think that's part of our problem with making this transition uh, that uh, it doesn't really work to keep harping on uh, the, the repercussions true as they may be you know, we're not denying any of the things that uh, the Bill and Matias said. They are certainly the reality of the situation. The problem is, how do we, how do we make changes? And I think in that case, uh, as the science of positive psychology is now beginning to reveal, uh, we have to take a different attitude, a different framing. We have to begin to focus on what are the, the positive repercussions of making the changes that, uh, that we all know are necessary. I think there's a lot of uh, evidence these days for, for how, that, how that might occur. So, uh, <clears throat> to introduce our, our speaker, I think Bhutan uh, and the Prime Minister have, have uh, taken the lead in this area of uh, focusing on um, what has been called gross national happiness rather than gross national product. The former king of Bhutan famously coined that phrase. How do we reframe this argument? How do we focus really on what contributes to, to human well-being and how we can go forward in, uh, um, in achieving that, that well-being? Um, both Josh and I uh, were, were honored uh, to be in Bhutan last February um, working with um, Ron Coleman and, several, and, and Tasha Chodi and several others there in um, uh, helping to, to plan a major event that occurred at the UN uh, on April 2nd uh, that was hosted by Bhutan. This was quite an amazing event uh, and it was uh, around the issue of uh, uh, defining a new economic paradigm based on human well-being and happiness. How do we change the fundamental goal of our enterprise away from growth at all costs 
towards well-being and, and, uh, and happiness as the fundamental, fundamental goal. And that has lots of implications. We certainly need sustainability as part of that. We need to address uh, distribution issues as part of that. Uh, we need to do all of the things I think that ec ecological economists have been talking about uh, from, the very, from the very beginning. Um, but I think we need to, to, to change that framing in a, in a way that, uh, that will actually motivate people towards achieving those goals. If any of you, or any of you at the 19, um, let's see, when was it, 94 meeting in Costa Rica of the International Society? Is anybody there at that meeting? A few of you. If you were there, you heard Dana Meadows talk about um, envisioning, you know, that, and uh, I think this relates to the whole issue of overcoming addictions. You need to have a positive vision of what we're trying to achieve in order to motivate people uh, to make changes in the, in the long run. Short run problems, I think, can be motivated by, by, by fear. But long run changes, the kinds of changes that we really need uh, to really uh, escape this trap that we seem to have set for ourselves, require, I think, um, uh, a positive vision. And I think we need to spend a lot more time actually creating that positive vision, looking at how that new economy would work, an economy embedded in, uh, in society and in nature, recognizing all of the interconnections and interdependencies, all of the things I think we've been talking about over the years. How do we actually communicate that positive vision, create it and communicate it in a shared way? And, and I think Dana was very clear about the necessity to, to build shared visions and not individual competing visions, which is what we seem to have now. I think that, to me, is, is um, a big part of what Bhutan is up to and can, can facilitate uh, to bring forward uh, this shared vision based on, on uh, happiness and, and well-being. So let me introduce to you um, Jigme Thinley, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bhutan, uh, who, will, uh, who will tell us uh, what his vision is and, and how uh, Bhutan has been facilitating this, this major change that I think will help us uh, to, to overcome and escape the, uh, the traps that we've set. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> After having listened to Dr. William Rees and uh, Mathis uh, Bakanagal, I'm not so sure whether I have anything interesting to offer. But let me tell you this. We should not despair. Yes, uh, human society is addicted to bad ways, uh, to self-destructive ways, but we are listening. Human society, the society is listening to you. And uh, we will find ways to get out of this addiction. And uh, I would like to tell you that Bhutan, for one, is trying. <clears throat> My friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Bob Costanza, and esteemed scientists, economists, scholars, and other respected members of the International Society for Ecological Economics. Allow me to begin by offering my profound congratulations to Dr. William Rees and to Global Footprint Network President, Dr. Mathis Varkanagel, co-creators of the Ecological Footprint. I offer my congratulations for their receipt here in Rio of the 2012 Kenneth E. Boulding Award, the world's top honor in ecological economics. This award means a lot to me personally, as I have known Mathis since 2005 when he presented the pivotal ecological footprint work to the second International Conference on Gross National Happiness, or GNH. And he joined us again to present the footprint at a meeting we hosted at the United Nations in April this year, about which I'll say more. A special ISEE release states that the prestigious biannual Bolding Award honors outstanding individuals who have contributed original and seminal approaches that have furthered our understanding of the interfaces between the social, ecological, ethical, economic, and political dimensions of our world. 
That statement perfectly expresses the admiration I have long felt for the pioneering and groundbreaking work of Drs. Rees and Wagenegel. The ecological footprint is certainly one of the most important and influential measurement and communication tools of the century. I regularly use the footprint results in my own statements and indeed rely on that information to understand and communicate the devastating impact of current consumption patterns to the world's limited resource base, on the world's limited resource base, and to urge more sustainable policies. It is without question one of the most powerful ways to put the responsibility of sustainability firmly on all our shoulders through awareness of every resource we consume and every nuance of our behaviors and lifestyles. But more than that, I can think of no instrument that more effectively joins the social and ecological dimensions of reality. By demonstrating the disproportionate contribution of wealthier consumers to current global overshoot, the ecological footprint is also one of the clearest ways to make the case for fairer distribution and greater global equity. Indeed, brilliant would be an understatement for the discovery, development, and use of this extraordinary tool. Congratulations, Bill and Mathis, on this vital achievement, and my gratitude to ISEE for acknowledging that splendid contribution through this year's Kenneth E. Boulding Award. Once again, congratulations. Indeed, it's my <clears throat> appreciation for the contributions of so many of you here that makes me truly delighted to be with you this evening here in Rio. I would go so far as to say that your work as ecological economists should actually be the primary reference point for the summit that is about to start. I do pray. Yes. I do pray that the summit beginning tomorrow will produce the innovation, vision, clear thinking, and decisive action needed to save life on this precious planet that we have inherited from past generations. But I think we know that, in practice, the real action, innovative thinking, and outstanding scholarship has come and will continue to come from you and from other great scientists progressive economists, thinkers, and civil society group, groups like yours. Indeed, what I find most encouraging in this moment of life-threatening planetary crisis and malaise is the powerful surge of brilliant ideas and pioneering activity from great minds and civil society movements around the world. Taking the lead where governments fear to tread and giving courageous expression to humankind's basic goodness and inherent wisdom. This wisdom and energy will and must generate the political will to act. And so it is to you that we look to continue taking the lead and to continue your superb and vital research, teaching and writing in the field of ecological economics that has revolutionized the field of economics. You have demonstrated beyond the shadow of doubt that it is absurd to isolate economic systems from the encompassing ecosystem that provides the life support and resources these economies need to survive and function, and which absorbs their wastes. More than that, your research has convincingly scotched the alleged dichotomy between jobs and environment and proved that ecologically responsible behavior makes economic and business sense and creates good jobs. Indeed, I can think of no field of study that has greater capability of persuading and cajoling governments. No. No. <laughs> to act.
Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to discover that my name hasn't been changed. <laughs> Everything else is changing moment by moment. <clears throat> <laughs> Indeed, I can think of no field of study that has greater capability of persuading and cajoling governments to act responsibly than your own. And that's why I'm so honored to be with you today. I would go so far as to say that we politicians can't act without you. Your work is literally the ground and credibility on which we need to stand to make the economic case for environmental protection, to demonstrate the inestimable value of our scarce resources, and to highlight the true benefits and costs of economic activity. As I was listening to Dr. Reyes, I just couldn't help wondering how wonderful it would be if he actually came and lectured the summit tomorrow. The first speech tomorrow should be his. <clears throat> In this era of fiscal restraint and economic crisis that has narrowed horizons to panicky and short-sighted stimulus, bailout and deficit reduction schemes, our natural world gets increasingly shorter shrift and diminishing policy attention. Especially now, your work is an even more timely reminder to expand our horizons and to think long term to enhance well-being. You have pointed to innovative solutions that can stabilize both the economy and the climate, to job creation through conservation and efficiency, and to ways that shorter, time, shorter work time and more equitable distribution can conserve resources while improving both productivity and quality of life. I'm deeply grateful to you for your extraordinary service to humankind, to our planet, and to all its inhabitants. You are literally planting the seeds of the new and sane economy and society of the future, certainly helping us to realize that we are addicted to the wrong things. But you didn't invite me here to sing a pain of praise to ecological economics. You've undoubtedly heard enough of that in your last four days of deliberations and sharing knowledge. And you already know the extraordinary value and importance of the work you do, or you would not have been drawn to this field in the first place. Rather, you invited me to say a few words about some actions are taking at home and promoting here at Rio. None of those actions, nor my people's deep commitment to ecological conservation, can be understood outside the context of our fourth king's proclamation three decades ago that, and I quote, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product, end quote. With those words, he set Bhutan on a unique and holistic development path that seeks to integrate sustainable and equitable socio-economic development with environmental conservation, cultural promotion, and good governance. Indeed, the happiness of which our king spoke has nothing to do with the common use of that word to denote an ephemeral passing mood. Happy today or unhappy tomorrow, due to some temporary external condition that, like praise or blame, gain or loss. Rather, he referred to the deep, abiding happiness that comes from living life in full harmony with the natural world, with our communities and fellow beings, and with our culture and spiritual heritage. In short, from feeling totally connected with our world. And yet our modern world, and particularly its economic system, promote precisely the reverse. 
a profound sense of alienation from the natural world and from each other. Cherishing self-interest and material gain, we destroy nature, degrade our natural and cultural heritage, disrespect indigenous knowledge, overwork, get stressed out, and no longer have time to enjoy each other's company, let alone to contemplate and meditate on life's deeper meaning. Myriad scholarly studies now show that massive gains in GDP and income have not made us happier. But even the best philosophy is not enough. And so we do our best to put gross national happiness or GNH into practice. We have a long way to go. But we do place the natural environment at the very center of all our development policies. Our constitution mandates that at least 60% of the Kingdom of Bhutan remain under forest cover in perpetuity. But in fact, we have now reached 80% forest cover, having started in the, initially with no more than 60% in 19, well, some 50 years ago. These, this in turn protects our rich biodiversity, safeguards watersheds, and expands wildlife corridors. Indeed, more than 50% of our country is now under full environmental protection in national parks and wilderness areas. We vowed at COP15 in Copenhagen always to remain a net carbon sink. We are now about to introduce a green tax on certain goods and we are working towards becoming the first country to be 100% organic. Meaning then, <laughs> these policies to protect nature have not come at the expense of human and social development. Our life expectancy has literally doubled in the last two generations. Healthcare and education are free. Rural health clinics and schools are sprouting throughout the land with 99% of primary aged children now in schools. Our 10th five-year plan is sharply reducing poverty and our 11th plan will focus on rural prosperity. In the most practical ways, we have discovered that caring for our natural world actually enhances social well-being. On Pedestrian Tuesdays, which we just started recently, Pedestrian Tuesdays, when private cars are banned from Bhutan's urban centers, our people not only cut their greenhouse gas and pollutant emissions, but socialize and enjoy each other's company as they walk to work. And in the midst of our rapid development, we are doing our best to maintain our ancient wisdom traditions and to strengthen our cultural values, principles, bonds, and practices. Those values find expression in our deep respect for all life and in our strong family and community bonds. In all this, we are acutely aware that what we measure is what gets policy attention and that what we count signifies what we value. And so we now assess progress in the Kingdom of Bhutan according to nine domains. These are ecological integrity, living standards, health, education, culture, community vitality, time use, good governance, and psychological well-being. Since 2007, we have administered two national GNH surveys, and these measures now guide our policy.
From the GNH survey results, we create a GNH index. And we use these indicators actively as a policy screening tool. Indeed, no major policy is implemented in Bhutan if it fails the GNH indicator test. That is why, for example, Bhutan has not joined the World Trade Organization. It failed the test. But we have also learned that to measure progress accurately and properly, indicators are not enough. GDP, as you here know better than anyone, is not an indicator, but an accounting system. To challenge the continued dominance of narrow GDP-based measures, we are therefore building a new holistic accounting system that accounts for the value of our nation's natural, human, social and cultural capital. And not only the manufactured and financial capital that is currently counted. In February this year, we released the first natural, human and social capital results of our new national accounts, which will be the foundation of the new economy we seek to build. Thanks to the superb works of Dr. Costanza and Dr. Kubishevsky, there, sitting there smiling, <clears throat> we discovered that our forests in Bhutan provide more than $14 billion a year worth of ecosystem services. Four times more than our whole GDP. Of that value, they found that 53% accrues to those beyond our borders. As our forests regulate the climate, store carbon, and protect watersheds from which others benefit. We suddenly realized that we were a donor country. <laughs> you can see that the principles of ecological economics are deeply penetrating our national fabric in Bhutan. Not only have doctors Kostanza and Kuvishevsky and their colleagues started to train our national statisticians, finance ministry officials, and many others in the new methods, but we see our emerging full benefit cost national accounts literally as a foundation of the new development model we are determined to build. The new accounts will change the way we present our annual budgets. As we account for the health of our forests, water sources, communities, and a wide range of natural and social assets. For example, we'll figure forest losses due to fire as a depreciation of our natural capital, and preventive expenditures to reduce alcoholism, smoking, and teenage pregnancy as investments in human capital. And the new accounts will make our policy making much more informed than it can possibly be when we rely on narrow market measures alone. And yet, for all our efforts to build the new development paradigm at home, Bhutan simply cannot go it alone. Even if we were to do everything right, which we certainly do not claim to, Greenhouse gas emissions in Chicago, Beijing, London, and here in Rio would still melt our glaciers, flood our valleys, and cause severe water shortages downstream. Nor is our economy isolated from the global GDP-based system that feeds consumerist and materialist temptations among our own people as much as anywhere else. We have learned the hard way that we can't build a GNH society on a GDP economy. And that our own capacity to practice what we preach at home cannot be separated either from global economic forces or from our own global responsibility. That's what brings us to Rio. And that's what led us to host 
a major high-level meeting on 2nd April that Dr. Costanza spoke of at the United Nations, where Dr. Costanza and Dr. Wachenegel and others here joined us in an ambitious effort to launch the new development paradigm globally. That seminal gathering on 2nd April, attended by more than 800 distinguished participants, acknowledged human happiness and the well-being of all life on Earth. Human happiness and the well-being of all life on Earth as the core goal of development. The planet is not ours alone. It recognized ecological sustainability, fair distribution, and the efficient use of resources as essential conditions towards that end. And it saw a healthy balance among thriving natural, social, cultural, and built assets as the key requirement of the new model. And that day at the United Nations, it was crystal clear to all present that what we were talking about had nothing to do with tinkering with the present system such as characterizes so much of the mainstream dialogue on the so-called green economy. On 2nd April at the United Nations, we were talking about a real and viable alternative to our present system, which, fueled by mindless consumerism, has depleted resources, degraded ecosystem services, accelerated greenhouse gas emissions, diminished biodiversity, and now threatens the survival of humans and other species on the planet. That system has also created yawning inequities and is generating global economic insecurity, indebtedness, instability, and conflict. What we are talking about, or rather what we were talking about that day at the UN, and what we will continue to talk about till it happens, is what the TELUS Institute calls the great transition to a new system based on different premises, values, goals, and understanding. We were deeply honored on 2nd April to be joined by the president of Costa Rica, which has you know, accomplished some amazing you know, achievements, truly, on the ecological front in particular, the UN Secretary General, and ministers and diplomats from around the world. But it was also quite clear that day that the real energy, dynamism, vision, clear thinking, and heartfelt will to act emanated from the hundreds of civil society leaders and brilliant scholars and analysts present, including ecological economists. And we will continue to need you and to draw on your expertise as we move forward. In fact, despite the extraordinary success of the 2nd April meeting at the UN, and despite the dynamic and buoyant spirit of that day, I cautioned there that it was far too early to celebrate. Our work has only just begun. And so, His Majesty the King of Bhutan is now convening an international expert working group to elaborate the details of the new development model over the coming two years for consideration by the 68th and 69th UN General Assembly sessions in 2013 and 2014. That working group will prepare detailed documentation, including thorough literature reviews and examinations of existing best practices on how the new paradigm can work in actual practice. What are its potential accounting and measurement systems, regulatory and financial mechanisms, and trade governance and other institutions? We politicians, and certainly my own tiny country, have neither the knowledge nor the capacity to undertake this huge work. We will clearly need your hands-on help and expertise. And I am deeply grateful to those in this room today who have already kindly offered to contribute to this major effort. 
In short, the time has come for governments to listen, learn and turn into practical policy outcomes at the systemic, national and global levels what you are demonstrating in the realm of impeccable scholarship, research and analysis. To that end, I promise you today that the Kingdom of Bhutan will do its utmost to promote and realize the vision and understanding that we share in the great transition to a new global order that genuinely promotes well-being and happiness. Just four days ago, at the UN headquarters in New York, I personally delivered to the UN Secretary General a full report of our second April landmark meeting, which he will now distribute to all UN member states. You can see the report on our meeting website at www.2april.gov.bt. Separately, I have also written to apr.gov.bt. Separately, I have also written to all heads of state or government, asking them to consider adopting and implementing the 12 specific policy recommendations that the second April meeting suggested to begin moving actively towards the new system. I would like to list some of those policy actions explicitly here because you will immediately recognize their roots in your work in ecological economics. Here, by way of example, are the 12 specific actions my country has asked all governments to consider on a voluntary basis, of course. One, in order to move towards sustainable production methods, governments should first remove perverse subsidies for fossil fuels. Chemical inputs in agriculture and other activities that are harmful to the economy and Two, <laughs> two, they should reinvest those subsidies in green technologies, poverty elevation, and sustainable infrastructure such as renewable energy, energy efficiency, public transit, watershed protection, and green public spaces. Three, they should move rapidly towards sustainable agriculture supporting small-scale local farming, training farmers in organic methods, and drawing on traditional knowledge. Four, they should declare oceans, water resources, the atmosphere, biodiversity, forests, coastlines, and cultural and sacred sites as common assets, and create trusts to manage and govern these common assets for the equitable benefit of current and future generations. Five, in order to dismantle incentives to excessive consumption, they should ban advertising to children. And eliminate perverse tax deductions by business for advertising. Six, they should support local economies with all public institutions procuring their food, goods, and services from local, organic, and fair trade sources. They should, very important ecological footprint analysis, aspect there. Number seven, uh, they should reduce systemic inequalities by capturing unearned income from land and currency speculation, making tax systems more progressive, and instituting work-sharing policies that reduce overwork, increase leisure time, and prevent layoffs. I think many of you are guilty of overwork. Eight, they should measure progress and well-being more accurately and comprehensively, value 
non-market assets and services in their national accounts and ensure that prices reflect the actual social and environmental costs of production. They should confine GDP to its original purpose of measuring market activity. Stop using it to measure progress, prosperity, and well-being, which it was never intended to, intended to do and can never do either. And educate the public on its flaws and shortcomings. By the way, uh, the World Bank has just announced that uh, uh, they would like to support 50 countries and 50 corporations to develop natural accounts, full cost accounting. Uh, and uh, Bhutan will be one of the 50 countries where we've in fact already started. But uh, this is very, very encouraging. <clears throat> Number nine, they should reward sustainable actions through payments for ecosystem services. Ten, they should penalize unsustainable behaviors through ecological tax reforms that tax pollution, carbon, and the depletion of our natural capital, and which use the resulting revenue to reduce burdens on low-income groups. Number 11, they should increase financial and fiscal prudence, penalize speculation, ensure equitable access to and responsible use of credit, and require financial instruments to contribute to the public good. Lastly, 12, they should collaborate actively and in good faith to attain international consensus, first on measures of progress, well-being, and full cost accounting, and by 2015, on formal adoption of the new development paradigm as a whole. You can clearly see the extraordinary and powerful influence of ecological economics in producing both these specific policy recommendations and in providing the profound thinking, research and understanding on which they are based. From a policy perspective, as I said at the start and repeat now, I literally cannot think of a more influential field of study in the world today than your own. You can see that we in Bhutan have come to rely on your work in the most practical ways. In fact, it is clear that ecological economics is a core foundation of the new global development paradigm that the world so urgently needs and that my country is now actively promoting. I would like to reiterate that without your outstanding research, we could neither demonstrate the practice, practical viability of the new model, nor make a credible economic case for adoption of policies like those I listed. Our best intentions would, would have or would remain theoretical. And so I extend my country's Sincere gratitude to all of you working in the field of ecological economics for your pioneering work in developing the methodologies, data sources, and models that we need in our shared endeavor. Your brilliant and tireless work is the essential empirical foundation for a decent and sustainable world that fully respects and cares for all life on Earth and which thereby promotes true human happiness. Rio must pay attention to what goes on here among you. My warmest congratulations on the successful completion of your 2012 ISEE conference here in Rio. May you spread the knowledge you have shared and generated in your last four days together far and wide for the benefit of all beings and for posterity. Thank you very much, Tasha Delik. Thank you so much, Honorable Prime Minister. That was a truly inspiring speech. 
And I think we can all agree that Bhutan is well on its way to becoming probably the world's first ecological economy. And that can serve as a model for, uh, for the rest of the world and also to facilitate the, the uh, adoption of the new economic paradigm, which is, I would say, very much the ecological economic paradigm. Next, we're going to have Josh Farley, who I think you all know. I think he needs a little introduction to this group. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Vermont in the um, Community Development and Applied Economics Department and also a fellow of the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics and has been involved with the field for many years. Um, I can't remember that when we first met, but it was at the University of Maryland and then we moved together to Vermont. And so I've known Josh for, uh, for many, many years. And he's going to offer some comments and reflections on, on what we've just heard. Josh. All right, so my first comment I have to say is that um, to extend my ex tremendous thanks to Prime Minister Thinley for coming here and speaking to us. And I think this is particularly important because we often come to these conferences and we hear the problems we face and we despair of people actually adopting and implementing the solutions we propose. And here we have now a head of state adopting and implementing these policies and the importance of that and uh, the, the hope it gives to us, I think, is really hard to overemphasize. Um. I'd also like to say that much of what we hear in this conference is about the biophysical limits, the limits to what we can achieve. And they are daunting limits. But we, what we've heard from the Prime Minister now is the other end of the scale. What we actually do want to achieve, the vision of a society we would all want to live in, and the way we can get there. So this is from the, you know, we hear too much about the, the possible means. Now we have a very positive vision of the desirable ends. I want to lay, to highlight a little bit about the ends that uh, Bhutan has chosen not to pursue, this ends of maximizing GDP, of ever increasing economic growth. So how do we maximize GDP? How does that work? Well, it works in the market system. We allocate our resources towards those industries that are willing to pay the most for them, who can produce the products of highest market value. We then ration those resources to the individuals able to pay the most. This maximizes market value. This maximizes GDP. So how does this work in the real world? Let's take a look at the year 2007, when a small decrease in food production led to a tripling of grain prices. So the idea of markets is we maximize that grain to the highest and best use. The highest and best use in this case happened to be allocating that grain to the United States and Europe, where the price of a loaf of bread went up by 10% as a share of our income. We had to spend one more percent of our income on food. So we purchased that food and we wasted 30% of it. At the same time, people in Asia, people in Africa were starving because they spend 50% of their budget on grain. So they, the, the highest and best use, according to this goal of maximizing GDP, was taking the food from the mouths of the starving to allocate to those people who could pay more, the Americans who literally wasted 30% of it. So this is the goal that Bhutan is willing to sacrifice. And I would have to say the pursuit of that goal that every other country in this planet, except for Bhutan, is essentially pursuing, reminds me of a great quote by Yogi Berra, a famous baseball player in the United States, who once said, we might be lost, but we're making great time. And I would argue that the pursuit of never-ending growth is absolutely the wrong goal. We're making great time, but we're desperately lost. Matisse talked about a plane with a fuel gauge. You don't get on a plane without a fuel gauge. You also don't get on a plane that's going somewhere you don't want to go. You get on the plane that's leading to a much better future, the place you want to be. Um, and so it's very interesting. If you look back to 1850, John Stuart Mill, he was in 1850, he said the economy of Britain was about at that point where they had met their basic economic needs. It was no longer important to pursue economic growth. What was important is pursue those things that really give you a high quality of life, those things that make being a human worthwhile. John Maynard Keynes, almost 100 years later, essentially said the same thing, that once we've achieved our economic growth goals, we've got to go for improving 
humanity, the things that make being a human worthwhile. Bolding said the same thing. Finally, we have somebody willing to act on this. It's the people acting on it are not the richest ones, not the ones who have so much, but rather a country of modest means has chosen to pursue a different set of ends, an ends that, as he said, has doubled their life expectancy, given education to the masses, has created a country that really is pursuing happiness, and it's evident when you go there that the people do feel a deep sense of enduring well-being. So uh, the countries in the United States, you know, we still believe we need more growth. This actually reminds me of a study. If you ask most Americans how much more income they would need to feel financially secure and happy, they typically say 20 to 30 percent more. Somebody did a study of the richest people in America, people who make more than $10 million a year. For them to feel financially secure, they say they would need to make twice as much. So I think what we find is we've got a society that's so driven by growth, the more we get, the more we feel we need. And it takes a country of modest means to lead the example, to set that example, that we are pursuing the wrong thing. We are lost. We're going in the wrong direction. This is a country that's going in the right direction. Um, and just as a final comment, some, uh, there was some environmentalists who wrote a paper saying that we need a positive vision of where, we were, where we're going. Martin Luther King did not attract the masses with an I have a nightmare vision. And he said that the problem with environmentalists is too often it's the I have a nightmare vision. Here we have the I have a dream vision. And it's a dream of a future with enough for all of us, with preserving our ecosystems, with greater equity, with a meaningful, desirable, sustainable future. And I just have to profoundly applaud Bhutan for pursuing that goal and to flip uh, Kenneth Boulding's words around for a beacon of sanity, recognizing the limits of growth, recognizing we have to pursue uh, greater happiness, greater progress in a different way, and I just would like to applaud the Prime Minister as a beacon of sanity in this world. So. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Prime Minister. And I, I think we have some time for some questions. If you would come up to the microphone, maybe line up behind the microphone, and I would encourage you to keep your questions uh, short and, and actual questions. We would, we would not like to have additional speeches as part of this the session, so uh, we'd like to hear questions, and uh, I'd just like to point out one other famous quote of Yogi Berra, one of our one of our most famous philosophers, and that is, "If you don't know where if you don't know where you're going, you end up somewhere else." <laughs> Thank you, Bob. And I think we need to we need to now know where we're going. Please. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm Ed Berry with the Sustainable World Initiative. Uh, your Excellency, uh, many thanks for all of your inspiring remarks. Uh, Bhutan has a relatively favorable amount of biocapacity in relation to your population size. So I'm wondering, does your country have a national population policy that seeks to stabilize your population? And also, what advice might you offer a neighboring country like Bangladesh that has a much more challenging population to biocapacity ratio? Thank you. Yes, uh, we do have uh, a population policy. <clears throat> And uh, it is that policy that has kept our population to where it is. We are still below one million people at 700,000. And uh, this is because of the fragile and the very small limited capacity of uh, the country, of its geography, the, 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 the kind of to topography that we have, the fact that uh, only about 8% of our country is in fact arable. The capacity of our country to carry population that we have had to adopt such a policy and uh, it is implemented quite seriously but of course voluntarily. Yes, Bangladesh does have on the other hand the problem of overpopulation and it is problems of the kind prevailing in Bangladesh and in other neighboring countries that have convinced us to pursue such a policy. Can you say, uh, say your name before yeah, you Yeah, uh, Brian Check with the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. And uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I very much want to thank you 
as the panelists have for leading globally in ecological economics and international affairs, uh, especially ecological microeconomics, uh, doing such wonderful work in valuing natural capital and adjusting accounts and so forth pursuant to that. Uh, I have a question about uh, Bhutan's intent to also carry one of the original uh, macroeconomic messages of ecological economics, namely that economic growth or degrowth are, are both unsustainable, but the steady state economy was and is a term that has attracted many, many people to ecological economics. And so while we see the uh, pursuit of gross national happiness as a wonderful and, and positive vision, we also, we would hate to uh, forsake the roots of ecological economics in recognizing a steady state economy as a sustainable macroeconomic goal. So I wonder if, if you could also help lead in international diplomacy, steady statesmanship, if you will. We are trying humbly and with uh, deep modesty. And I'm happy to uh, say that uh, people around the world, at the individual level, community level, sub-national level, and indeed even at national levels, our message is being heard. And here in Brazil, for instance, uh, GNH is something that uh, people are very excited about. And there are so many municipalities that have already started implementing or applying our index in measuring true progress. We have been profession, professional economists and ecological economists have been talking about theory and economic and ecological answers. We raise political questions and you have shown the pathway how to deal with those political questions. Point is now, 100 years ago, Gandhiji in this little booklet, Hind Swaraj, he told to the world a message to build ecological civilization. And we are so deeply touched that you have shown us the pathway to build that ecological civilization. Can, it, can we take it that this approach in a, you see, in a reasonable time can take us beyond the whole madness that world is caught in of growth and globalization and uh, state and market? I think this is the fundamental question. Even here, we last four days, we have been deliberating. There was, yes, obsession with the growth is bad, but then people were talking about green growth. What could be the content of that growth, I think you have shown us. And this ecological and ethical approach to economics, uh, when you think would be the order of the world order, because it is very obvious we cannot build a sustainable society uh, without ecological democracy. So how, how do you see what Bhutan has accomplished? Uh, how, how do we see, see it replicating in the world? Well, Bhutan on this path is trying, and I've explained to you uh, quite elaborately how. <clears throat> but let me tell you, uh, Professor, that um, there are times when uh, one finds more reason to despair than to hope. But uh, you look at an event like this here in, in Brazil, where the Rio Plus 20 uh, affair will begin tomorrow. And uh, there will be about 150 heads of state and government that will participate, that will converge here onto Rio. And that, I think, is definitely an expression, a manifestation of the realization of people and countries that we need to change that there is something badly wrong uh, about the way in which we live, morally and ethically. And um, I uh, cannot say as to what kind of outcome we can expect. 
In terms of the actual outcome document, it may not be much. But I think uh, the will and the realization that would be generated at the national level, at the sovereign level, I think will be far greater in significance and impact than what will actually be written down and agreed upon in the form of a contract or compact that is the outcome document. I'm encouraged by India, for instance, Professor, for uh, having invited me to speak at the parliament. Yes, and uh, it, it was very well attended. And uh, the fact that the parliament of India is interested in hearing such a concept, I think, gives us reasons to hope. I think there are moves in China also. In, in fact, China may, in the very near future, be leading, showing the green way in terms of the ex investments they are making, for instance, in green technology, for instance. I have reasons to be hopeful. We should not despair, and you must not despair. Clóvis Cavalcante, from Brazil. Uh, in 1994, in Costa Rica, I met people from Bhutan at our meeting of uh, the International Society for Ecological Economics. And then I talked with them. I asked a question in relation to the number of tourists you accepted there. At that time, I had read that uh, you permitted only 4,000 tourists a year. They said, no, no, now we are accepting 9,000. So it was a big jump from 4,000 to 9,000. And uh, I consider that we have a small island in my state, uh, in the northeast of Brazil, called Fernando de Noronha, which is a very nice place. It accept, it's very small, very small, 25 square kilometers. They accept per day 200 tourists, 200 for a very small area. And you accept, you accepted in 1994, 9,000 tourists. My question is, uh, how are you considering the movement of tourists towards Bhutan? Are you afraid of tourists? What, what, do, you, what do you think the tourists can bring to, to pro cause problems to your model. And the second question is the following. What is the place of affection in your model? Affection. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> two questions, in fact. Uh, let me um, make it simple. Uh, we follow the government the country, country's tourism sector is guided by a policy to which we have been faithful ever since it was conceived um, and decided upon some 20 years ago. And that is the policy of high value, low impact tourism. Now, uh, uh, with respect to high value, we are promoting Bhutan, sadly, as a high-end destination. Okay. In terms of uh, low impact, the number of tourists that can enter the country will, be, will depend on the capacity of the country to absorb, the absorption capacity in terms of its ecology, in terms of its culture, in terms of the various aspects uh, that we need to consider. And um, I'm afraid uh, the number is far greater than the 9,000 that you mentioned. Uh, it's growing, but as I said, we remain faithful to this policy of high value, low impact. And so the sustainability is the question. And we will not accept tourists beyond what we can sustain. On the second subject, <clears throat> we uh, pursue GNH very seriously in Bhutan. And um, one of the things that we try to promote and uh, we want to preserve is what we still have in Bhutan and uh, what 
many of, of the developing countries still have, and that is the extended family network, which is normally the victim of modernization and industrialization, which falls prey to the normal trend of nuclearization. We are giving importance to preserving uh, the family uh, network as the, and in fact the extended family network, as the most natural and sustainable social safety net. Uh, so, in order to uh, maintain that, affection is very important, love is very important, relationships are important. In fact, it's GNH is really all about relationships. When relationships rise, happiness level rises. And when relationships fail, sadness, unfortunately, creeps in. So, affection is important, sir. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have time for one more question, so this will have to be the last one. Okay, my great honor. Oh, thank you very much for your words. They're really, they're really inspiring and they give us hope. I would like uh, you, though, to uh, talk about an example of a failure you had to face in Bhutan and how did you deal with that? Or a big challenge that you, you don't have a solution for yet and how are you dealing with that? Thank you. <laughs> Even you know, I've come here to talk only about successes. <laughs> I think many failures. And a country like Bhutan, um, that um, still aspires to uh, provide to our people basic services, basic amenities. Uh, challenges are enormous. And every day against these basic aspirations, we, because of the limitations in terms of our resources, in terms of access to technology, in terms of finance and so on, we face disappointments. But we are not discouraged. We will continue, and, um, and I think, uh, as it has been for Bhutan, it is important that uh, we focus more on our success and take inspiration from the little that we achieve and try and not be deterred by our failures. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think that was a good question. Uh, so I come from a neighboring country, India, and my question is, why is Bhutan not thinking of coming up with a good university? Uh, the reason is, please don't read me wrong here, we, we do like Bhutan students coming to India, but we feel that coming to such an unhappy country, you're making them unhappy, rather than why don't you open it up there, and I think it will add to their happiness if they can get their higher education in Bhutan, and it would also open up a lot of job avenues for People. Where did you say you're from? I'm from India, from Assam. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, uh, we are neighbors. Assam is our immediate neighbor to the south. Obviously, you have not been visiting Bhutan. No, I did. I did <laughs> visit. But most of the people say that they have got their uh, degrees from India and okay. JNU mostly. So, I just well, am curious. Uh, Bhutan, uh, thank you very much for your question. Bhutan has always paid the highest importance to human resource development. And um, <clears throat> while we have always had a good secondary education system, we have relied mainly on universities outside Bhutan, India, Bangladesh, and uh, really all the Anglophone countries in the world. Uh, but uh, we also realized the importance of having our own higher education system as well. And it's been now, I think, uh, 12 years or so that we established the Royal University of Bhutan. Yes, we have our, our university, own university, and beyond that, we have just signed a contract to um, establish, with a, with a company, to establish the first education 
city in Bhutan, which will attract institutions, some of the best institutions in the world to open branches and chapters in Bhutan. Come and study there. Okay, I know that the, the time for questions has been cut short, so I'm just going to com compliment you. I'm going to compliment the people of Bhutan for having such a charming, witty, and knowledgeable Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you. So. Thank you. Join me one more time in thanking uh, the Honorable Prime Minister for his leadership and inspiration uh, to all of us, and we wish you all happiness. The famous final words. <laughs> We're getting near the end. So uh, I was start talking and then Mina and, and Peter. As I was uh, saying to Peter, we were uh, short of money but we think we did a good job. And we did a good job because we have uh, preparation and uh, I talked to this about this in my early speech. And there, wa uh, there was a good work during the conference. So uh, MCI made a good work, the staff of the hotel, the volunteers. Is Valeria here? Oh, Valeria was the, the boss of the volunteers. <laughs> and the speakers, the people who made presentation, and especially you, the public. No? Uh, I work with statistics and indicators. And the, the main indicator of success of uh, a conference is the public in quantity and quality and you were the best so well it's it's time to say au not not goodbye um, and it's it's a pity that we are saying this today because i feel that over the last four days we've begun to build a sense of community uh, and uh, solidarity um, and there's been an energy in this conference, which uh, having been in Costa Rica, from Costa Rica and Tunisia and many other conferences, that I felt, uh, and I hope you have too. And I hope we can carry this energy forward uh, for IC to subsequent conferences, because this conversation has only just begun. It's not going to stop here. But it's a wonderful point to end this conference, I feel, on this uh, inspirational note, because for four days we've talked about the problems and the challenges, and here we actually have a sense of the possibilities. If one country can do it, so can all. Just as they say, if one village can do it, so can all villages. Since I, I usually use the rural metaphor, uh, I talk of rural economies, but of course that's true for cities as well. Uh, and, and finally, I think one of the things is we started is that uh, both within ecological economics and in the conversations going on from tomorrow onwards uh, in the NGO forum as well as in uh, Rio Plus 20, there is the potential for conflict, but there's also the possibility of cooperation. People can diverge, but there's also the possibility of convergence. So I very much hope that we'll move towards cooperation and convergence. Um, and with that hope, uh, let me thank you all for coming and stay with us and let's carry the movement forward. We'll see you in 2014, if not below, uh, before in other spaces. Thank you. Uh, but I, I just wanted to thank all of you for coming to Rio once more. It's been really great to have you visiting my, my adopted city. Uh, where I uh, uh, welcome you all as part of a family that has grown. Uh, I have a question too. Oh, Paolo has a question. Uh, it's, uh, the people are talking that the uh, next IC conference will be in Bhutan. It's really. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we can have a candidacy. I think if the. <laughs> Remember, it's another, it's another high-end location. <laughs> so, 
let's see how deep our pockets are. But anyway, uh, we have a very strong and very positive uh, invitation from uh, Reykjavik and uh, the university there. And I think we're going to go there. But why not 2016? Anybody have a good proposal to put that together? That sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, so I just want to uh, give my last thanks to everybody. The, the local organizing committee, uh, on behalf of the, you know, the scientific committee that Avina shared, that involved a number of, of our uh, uh, colleagues all over the world, uh, mostly the board members of ISEE and the, uh, and the presidents of the regional societies, and uh, our local organizing committee that I chaired, but that involved very, very uh, strong in engagement by, particularly by Paolo uh, Bibieli and Fred Cavadas, from, uh, who are now really, uh, going to carry the ball with Echo Echo from here, and uh, also Jose Ferris, uh, and Valeria again. Uh, Valeria, I also want to thank Valeria and Leandra, who participated both in the local organizing committee and in organizing the entire volunteer network that uh, accompanied this, this conference, and I hope will be uh, submitting to us a kind of rundown of all the things they heard uh, that you said, and then uh, we tried to, to uh, take that forward to have a, some kind of a documentary result of this meeting. We, we, we've also had the benefit of uh, continuous filming going on during all of, the, uh, all of the plenaries here, and some of the side meetings and uh, photography has gone on, so I think you, we're going to take advantage of some of the visual material that's being generated. Uh, I hope we'll be having access to the, uh, to the material to put on our site, but it will also be available through the uh, INCT uh, site that is financing the, the photography. Um, I wanted to really thank the, uh, uh, Ron Coleman, who was uh, together with Bob and, and Josh brought uh, the, uh, the Honorable uh, Prime Minister here uh, to us tonight. And uh, Ron isn't here, but he was, he's been, been very much involved with, with uh, the coordinating the uh, Prime Minister's insertion of all these, in, uh, all of these events. Uh, I want to finally thank the uh, MCI group that were our, our, our management organization that helped us to put this together. Uh, uh, particularly Gina, Christine, Bruna, Juliana, Jessica, all these names that I'm sure you've seen hundreds of times in emails and, and uh, f form letters saying, you know, uh, you have to pay such and such to do such and such. Uh, these are, there are people behind these and you've seen them uh, uh, running around here today over the last few days. Uh, finally, our, uh, uh, our sponsors. Uh, you know, you see them all behind us and our partners, institutional partners who have made it possible for us to bring this together, particularly Santander, the National Development Bank, uh, the CNPK, the NSET, PPG, and so on. Uh, and uh, just, you know, as a last, last hurrah, I just want to uh, express my own appreciation personally for having been part of ISEE and uh, this is my second conference that I put together. This is by far uh, the most significant event that I've ever done. I probably never never do anything at this scale again, thank God. Uh, uh, but uh, thank you all for bearing with me and our, the group here and making this all possible. Thank you very much for coming. Bye -bye. This is this is an uh, unauthorized but uh, just edition. Um, we didn't really talk about it in great depth, but is it on? No. But uh, many of you had sent us full papers, others had sent abstracts. Um, we thought we would explore the possibility of bringing out some volumes if we are able to make them cohesive. So those of you who have full papers that might want to be considered uh, for um, two or three volumes, depending on what, how they shape up, please do write in. Uh, write in to Peter, copy to me, um, and uh, we can see where we can take it from there. Um, submission, of course, we'll, there'll be a vetting process, uh, and uh, we'll need to see how they form possibilities of uh, publication um, in some form. Um, and finally, in thanks, there are also people 
who, without whose continued inputs, you know, on the audiovisual and on the on the video, and and everybody that we don't see, the invisible um, that have that has made this possible, uh, whose names we have not been able to mention, I'd like to thank them as well um, on all our behalfs, including the the very kind person who keeps filling our glasses. <laughs> thank you. I just one last thing about about the uh, the publication process that we we do have the CD ROMs, but the same information that's on the CD ROMs is going to be or as is already on site on the uh, the conference site. And if you what we could do if you're interested in still posting full papers, we can receive those if you send them to us directly. We'll make sure that they get online. Okay, so that's not a closed process. Okay. In addition to potential. In addition to, yeah. Thanks to Kevin Carroll in one way, by whom all of us will join in conveying our most deep held thanks to Gina G and Peter and you on behalf of the.